Hi, everybody. I'm so glad that you could join us today for this conversation with Dr. Jerry Sitzer. Um, Dr. Sitzer and I talked about grief and hope uh, two years ago, almost exactly. Um, we were trying to figure out then how do you merge the realities of, of grief and hope. It was early April of uh, 2020, and uh, we're just in the beginnings of the COVID pandemic. And um, we were at that place where we'd gotten the word that country had gotten the word that that the coming week was probably going to be the highest number of people um, passing away due to COVID infection. And it was just a very, very scary time. I remember how scary it was with lockdown and um, a virus that seemed to be, you know, the world was going crazy at the time. And, and we had we just but even so, we had no idea what was ahead of us. We were, I think I talked to a lot of people who were, you know, really hopeful that with just in a short period of time, this terrible disease, this terrible time would be gone and we would, life would get back to normal and everything would be as it was. And, you know, we were just completely either blissfully ignorant or, or totally naive about really what was ahead. You know, the number of deaths and illnesses, the economic disasters, um, disruption of really life is as around the globe of life as we knew it. We didn't know how long it was going to last. We just didn't know that the world was about to change maybe, you know, forever in some ways. And and here we are in early spring of 2022 living in a in a whole new world. And um there is just so much to grieve if we stop long enough to acknowledge it. And I think surely at the top of, besides all of our personal losses and things that we've experienced just in two years of living, um, I think maybe one of the things at the top of the list for us to grieve is loss of a way of life or loss of a world uh, as, as we knew it. And it sort of reminds me a little bit of, um, Pre 9-11, there was life before 9-11, 9-11 happened, and we have a post 9-11 world uh, where things never in some ways got back to exactly the way they were before. And we have a pre-COVID world, um, and we have a world that isn't post-COVID. We are still, we are still in this. And these two years have just been full of chaos on every level, not only the pandemic, but, you know, in the United States, political upheaval, there's been, you know, racial division and terrible losses. And how do we even begin to catalog all these losses? Well, because of that, there is our guest today is the person that I wanted to talk to probably above anybody else, because I feel like in the years that I've known um, Dr. Sitzer, I have an appreciation for the ways that he knows grief. Um, and 30 years ago, he, he experienced a catastrophic loss. And a few years after that, he wrote a very profound book, a book that um, called The Grace Disguised. And it quickly became mine and Rick's favorite book on grief. I've read lots of book on grief, but this one became my go-to book. And it's my go-to book when I've needed comfort, when I've needed reassurance that I was going to make it, that we were we were going to live through our own catastrophic loss of our son, that even though the world is sometimes feels spinning madly out of control, we we will make it, we will survive. And so, Doctor Sister's book has been um, just this rock uh, for me, and the Lord has used it so powerfully. So when I started thinking about um, grief and talking about grief, he's always first on my list. His publishers have just re-released um, in a new cover and with two, two more new chapters in his book, A Grace Disguised, How the Soul Grows Through Loss. And uh, it just is just my privilege to talk with him today. So let me give you the formal introduction. He's a professor of theology and a senior fellow at Whitworth University in Spokane, Washington. He specializes in the history of Christianity, Christian spirituality, and religion in American public life. Here's a fun one. His students have voted him the most influential professor 10 times. He's written nine books, among them, the book I just mentioned, A Grace Disguised, How the Soul Grows Through Loss, and A Grace Revealed, How God Redeems the Story of Your Life. He's been married to Patricia since 2010. 
He has three married children, two married stepchildren, and eight grandchildren. And I would love for you to give just a very warm welcome in your heart to Dr. Jerry Sitzer. So Jerry, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, thank you, Kay. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I, I hate to correct you right away in our conversation. <laughs> oh dear. I have nine grandchildren and two more that are ready to be birthed. So we're almost up to 11. And get this, of the 11, when the two are born, a nine are gonna be five and under. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now that's a party. That leads to a crazy life. Yeah. Yeah. That that is a party in a can is what I would call that. Yeah. Well, congratulations yeah. on those new Thank grandchildren. You. That's that's amazing. Well, there there really is so much that I want to talk about. And when you and I have had conversations, um, it's always the kind of conversation that I I hate to ever cut it off because it just I I I glean so much from our interaction and what God has used you to teach me. But I'd like it if you wouldn't mind just kind of starting telling our audience, um, you know, you were introduced to catastrophic loss in, in a very um, terrible and painful way. And I would really like for our audience to hear from you um, where this, this terrible grief journey began. Oh, thanks, Kay. Um, actually, I'm gonna do it in a, an unusual way. I just thought of this right now, so it may be a mistake, but I got a call. Uh, this has happened to me quite often in the last 30 years is I'll, I'll get a call or an email from somebody who was on the scene of the accident, emergency people, police officers, and for some reason they've wanted to connect with me because uh, so many people died in that accident. It was so highly traumatic. Well, in this case, a woman had called me, she was 20 years old. She was actually first on the scene of the accident. Wow. 20 years old, an art major at a university, uh, she had a date with her and another couple in the back seat. She just jumped out of the car, came up to our car. I handed her my four-year-old daughter, Dinah Jane, who had just died in my arms and handed her to this 20-year-old girl and then turned to pay attention to my wife who was catastrophically injured. And in the next 15 minutes, she died. And then eventually I went around the back of the van and discovered my mother was near death too. So the short of it is we were hit by a drunken driver uh, on a remote uh, stretch of highway in the state of Idaho. And um, um, uh, we had our whole family with us and my mother who was visiting for the weekend. And uh, when the dust settled, my mother, then 75, who has uh, died and my wife, uh, Linda, who was 42, and one of my children, Diana Jane, who was four. Uh, the driver's wife also died, and she was nine months pregnant, and the baby died. So you, you can imagine what it was like for this 20-year-old to step into that world. And uh, she waited all this time. Uh, and interesting, what turned her uh, uh, finally to the, in the direction of contacting me is that uh, she went on Facebook. She thought about this for 30 years, went on Facebook and saw a bunch of photos of our family. And she smiled and she said, you looked, you all look so beautiful to me. And then I knew I wanted to reconnect to you to find out what had happened. So what a lovely conversation we had, but it was not without pain too. That's 30 years ago, okay? That's a long time. And so much has happened since then. And as we both know, um, I, I said, um, I can't remember, I've already said this in this conversation or just when you and I were chatting before, but it's um, nine years, you know, right, right here in the early spring since, mm -hmm. since our son, Matthew died by suicide. And, um, and you just said, it's been 30 years, you know, since your wife and your mother and your, your little girl um, died. And in some ways, time means nothing. It means nothing. And in other ways, it is it is lengths of days that you can't even put into words. Mm -hmm. It it really does create a kind of time warp. Uh, when when I talked with that one young woman, while well, she's not young anymore, she's fifty now. But when she called me, uh, it was as if the accident happened yesterday. I, my memory is still um, vivid. And I, you know, it's sort of vi uh, uh, um, terrifyingly vivid in some ways, but over time it recedes more into the background. It's like a mountain that's 
that's settled into a larger landscape of mountain peaks and lakes and rivers and forests and so on and so forth. So it doesn't dominate my mind as much as it used to, but it's never gone away. And as strange as this sounds, Kay, I don't want it to anymore. I've made, I've made a kind of strange friendship with, with the memory, actually not just the memory of my loved ones, but the memory of the accident itself. And I'm able to carry it now with more grace than I did right after the accident when it was nothing but just a huge trauma in my life. And yet it feels like it's 100 years ago because we've done so much living between then and now. Absolutely. I can still hear the sound. If I just kind of close my eyes and I'm quiet, I can hear the sound of, um, of Matthew dropping his keychain on the ceramic fireplace surround in our living room as he would come into our house as an adult. He would yep. come and there was just, I can, I can hear that sound mm-hmm. of so clearly and why that is impressed on my mind Um, I really don't know, but it's just interesting how, and then the day that he died and all that happened and so many things about it and afterwards, but it's just the way our minds work and the way memories are held that we, that, that we can still hear sound, even though we can't hear or we see, or, and, um, and that is both a beauty and a, it's both a blessing and, um, can be a burden. I think, as you said, initially, those kind of memories are not a blessing. They are enough to take you to your knees. Um, at least for me, you know, those initial memories of, of, uh, the day Matthew took his life, they, those memories are, um, that's still hard for me to find anything. I don't know that I ever will find anything good, you know, about the day he died where I've come in those times since yes, but you know, just the reality of, of um, sometimes it's, it all has to fall under the mercy of God, or we would lose our minds. We would, and it does haunt. And some things we can't pronounce as good. Some things are bad, and they're permanently bad. I mean, this is why uh, Good Friday is good, and it's terrible at the same time. Uh, I mean, the, the human race executed the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Now we know what the outcome is and we can celebrate that, but we still have to pronounce that act itself as a terrible thing. Well, the same thing happened to you and the same thing happened to me. And I think when we have those kinds of traumatic experiences, it becomes frozen in our brain. It's like a deep neural pathway that remains permanent and you just can't fill it in. But over time, it does change roles in your life. I think that's the most that we can hopeful. Yes. That certainly did as, happen to me. And I would concur. That has been my experience as well. Um, the, the, um, the intensity of all that we felt, all yeah. that we experienced, the intensity has dialed down, yeah. but the, the pain of it and the it's just, it, I, I like the way you, t- you give so many good metaphors in the book about, like you, you alluded to one just a moment ago about the mountain. Um, and you talk in the book about the mountain of grief. Would you just ex- expand on that just a little bit? Well, um, um, in the aftermath of any, any kind of loss, and it can be any kind of loss, loss of a marriage, loss of health, loss of a job, loss of a reputation, loss of a loved one, so on and so forth, you know. Um, that event becomes like Mount Rainier when you're a half a mile away. It so dominates the landscape of your life that is literally all you can see. Uh, Over time, uh, the mountain doesn't change size or height. Nothing changes about that mountain, but you gain greater distance from it and you see the mountain uh, situated in a larger landscape. It never goes away, but you see it from a different kind of perspective. And I think, I think we can hope for that. And it does make a difference. We learn to carry it better. We learn to see it differently. And uh, we do so with greater hope and confidence and humility. At first, it's all we see. And, and in my case, the only thing I heard was the sound of the accident. The only 
uh, sight in my eyes was broken glass and broken bodies, you know, and it's still there, uh, but it's there in a different way. Yeah. I'm not debilitated uh, anymore. Yes. And that is so hopeful. I think for anyone who's newly bereaved or the grief is just fresh or it hasn't been that long. And, you know, everybody's so individually, somebody could yeah. say they, you know, it's been six months and somebody else will go, it's been six years. And I still, so it's, it's not like there's a, a this magic number. It really is unique no, to us as is. individual grievers, but regardless, somewhere in that grief journey, that mountain will appear differently in your landscape. Mm -hmm. And, um, and just, I, I find that so hopeful uh, because I know initially there just is the sense you're not going to, you cannot get through, you can't even get through this. And I was thinking as I was, I, I just always, um, well, I reread your book often or snippets of it because it, it truly has just provided so much wisdom for us. But I was just reading again um, and you talked about how, um, you know, you were a little bit of just a zombie uh, for, uh, and you weren't even really sure there were some days you weren't sure that you wanted to survive, even though you had surviving children that you were responsible for just as a person. And I can certainly identify that. And were there really moments, I can say there were times for me that um, I wasn't sure I wanted to survive. Yes, I had, but I wasn't sure I want. People say, you're going to survive. And I think to myself, I'm not sure I want to. I'm not really sure I want to survive. Yeah. In, in my case, obviously, my three children, the, the three surviving children were eight and barely seven and two. And my two-year-old was really injured seriously. So that took a lot of attention as well. And uh, so I think this, the biggest struggle for me is that I felt my children had lost the better parent. And I, I, I was so sad about that, not just the loss of them, but what that loss meant for my children. And not just their mother, but they lost, I think, the person who would have simply been the better parent for them. Now, I was on a crash course to learn how to do this, no pun intended here. I mean, I, I worked hard and, and uh, I think over time I've matured into a, a reasonably good parent. But that, that thought has never left me, Kay, to tell you the truth. There's a little bit of me that feels like my kids were robbed of the better parent. And if one or the other of us was going to go, it should have been me, not her. Uh, this is just one of the ironies of life. You think that something happens and you think, wait a minute, that just isn't right. That isn't fair. That was the wrong decision there. And <laughs> you don't have a choice. The only choice we have is to keep going and figure out how to make life work under circumstances when we feel at the deepest of levels that it's simply not the right thing. Yeah. So that and that thought, as I said before, has never really left me. I think it falls into that almost unanswerable. It's like there's no good words right. that I can. I mean, there's no there's sometimes there's no good words for the pain, the, the, the pain that we feel. But I could just receive that from you and not try to talk you out of it. I think um, I found that people often tried to talk me out of my feelings Oh, oh that's, because that's dangerous to do. Mm -hmm. Well, it is, but see, my they my want natural you to feel better. Well, they want it you does, to feel but better. they want a comfort, and like even just me listening to you say that, my instant reaction, my my just my instant reaction is to say, Ah, Jerry, I I know you have been a really good dad, and and your kids would are so grateful that I mean I could I can think of all the things that are probably true but it doesn't wipe out the sense in you that you think your wife would have been a better parent and and so to be able then through my my own experience to stifle that response of trying to kind of pat you on the shoulder minimize your pain oh you're a good dad you're a good dad you've been a good dad um and to just really just sit here and receive you saying, I think that my wife was a better parent, would have been the better parent. I can't make that go away. I can't talk you out of it. Mm -hmm. And learning not to talk people who are grieving out of their feelings is a skill we have to learn because yeah. that doesn't come naturally to us. It doesn't. Well, and it's partly our compassion 
that wants to talk people out of it because we don't want to see them live with such pain. And we're hoping that if we somehow use our rational voice and say, oh, okay, that isn't true, that it's going to make them feel better. And of course, it, it doesn't. We have to let to go with that conversation rather than to try to run contrary to it. Just yeah, I rem to... sorry, I, I was just gonna say, okay. I remember um, when I was, um, I think sometimes, I guess a lot of times there's regrets around when somebody dies. Um, should we have done this? What if we had done that? What if, you know, all the all the scenarios of what if we had done uh, that? And I wanna talk more about that later when you, in your, cause you talk about that in your last chapter. But for now, I'm just um, trying to get to the place of, I remember saying to people the regrets that I had about Matthew and some of the ways that we had sought treatment for his mental illness, yeah. um, that looking back, I just feel like, what was the matter with me? Why did I do that? Why did I do that? That was, that was a really dumb way to do that. And, and, and the pain of knowing that I caused him pain, Yeah. but I can't do anything about it. No. I can't do anything about it. And so I got to the place that when I was talking to the counselor that, that I spoke to so many times um, and still do about this, um, I said, I need to tell you some things. Please don't try to talk me out of them. Please don't tell me I shouldn't have those regrets. Please don't tell me that any of that, please just let me say this, mm -hmm. please. And um, to be able for grievers, for mourners to articulate that sometimes they just need to say the things and they don't want anybody else to make them feel better. Mm -hmm. We just want the pain to be received yeah. by the listener. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the irony here, Kay, is that in much of life, we do things, we say things that are stupid, we're impatient, we insult, um, we, we, uh, we make bad decisions with our kids, uh, but because life is a motion picture, uh, a day or a week or a year later, we can kind of swing back and make that right. But when we have a sudden death, as your son's death was, or as the accident was, all of a sudden it just stops. And you have to live with that story that's incomplete. And there's something horrible about that. Yes. An incomplete story where you wish you had been able to say something or made, make a different decision or set a different course in some way or um, repair a relationship that needed to be repaired. We always operate on the assumption that there's going to be a tomorrow. It's just innate in us to do that. And sometimes there is no tomorrow. And then you have to live with that incomplete story. And I just think it's better to look at it and say it's incomplete. And I, I wish I could change some things. Yeah. And then once you do that work to say, but I'm still alive. And it's an insult to that person to let my life die because yeah. theirs has died. I, I'm a, I talk about this a little bit later, but my uh, great nephew Jude just died of cancer uh, mm -hmm. uh, three weeks I'm ago, so sorry. his memorial service two weeks ago. And and, uh, you know, in, in this case, um, you've got this storyline going in his life and all of a sudden it's done. And uh, in the memorial service, I said to the many, many people who are there in a memorial service, we have to speak about the dead and tell their story and emphasize the good qualities they had and maybe hint at some of the things that were not so good but we talk about them, but a memorial service should also be allowing them to speak to us. And one of the things that they would say is keep living, keep embracing life. It's not going to do anyone any good for you to die because I have died. And sometime we have to make that turn where in spite of regret and grief and all kinds of other things that we wish we could reverse, the incompleteness of that relationship, a broken marriage, whatever it happens to be, we have to say, well, that's incomplete, but my life story is still not incomplete, and to choose to keep living. Hmm. I imagine that that wasn't um, a thought that was very uh, 
prominent in your mind, you know, in the very beginning. Um, I think that's a, that's a perspective that has come, you know, through um, many, many tears and many, uh, many, many times of not knowing how you were going to get through a day. So how did you cope, you know, initially you, you talked about that there were some things that you did, obviously taking care of your young children was a super high priority, but how did you cope with your own grief in the beginning? How did, were there some habits and some practices that you developed that, that kind of carried you through those initial days, months, (laughs) years? Well, I use the word endure um, more often than survive. Uh, I mean, survive isn't a bad word, but I think endure uh, is more fitting for my experience. I literally just had to get out of bed in the morning and make life happen. I had to put food on the table and get my kids to music and soccer practice and everything else and tuck them into bed at night and sing them hymns and pray with them and go on vacations and make a living and and try to manage the home and do the best I could to raise them. They were so little, you know, and they had their own grief too. So uh, it's the force of responsibility that basically summoned me to, to responsibility. Keep living, you've got stuff to do here. The loss has already been bad enough, in fact, this is an unusual experience I had. It's one of those moments of clarity that every once in a while we get. There was an hour uh, between the scene of the accident and the emergency room, the hospital we went to, because it was in rural Idaho. And the four of us were together in that, emerg- in that uh, vehicle. And I, I had a moment of clarity that was overwhelming to me. It's probably the most rational I've ever been in my entire life. It's like It's like the air became clear after a rainstorm and the sun comes out. It's just, everything is shimmering. That's what it was like for me. And I realized that what had happened was irreversible and that something amazing, catastrophic, horrible, big, gigantic had taken place and that I had no power to reverse any of it. But I did have power how I I was gonna respond. And I remember saying to God, and then I stopped praying for like two years, but I did pray in that moment. And I said to God, the bleeding is going to stop with me here and now. I'm not going to let this set off a chain reaction of pain that's going to go on generations. I just won't do it. Now, that was kind of a heroic response, and I have no idea what I was saying. But there was this deep kind of fatherly determination that said, this is enough. Three generations of people, all female gone is enough. I do not want to let this continue. Yeah. So that really motivated me, uh, Kay, to figure out how to make life work. So as you put it, as you mentioned, uh, I made a distinction between mourning and grieving. Mourning is just the raw emotion you feel. Grieving is a more... Um, um, rhythmic way of dealing with your losses. It's more intentional. It, it's more a uh, liturgical, if you will. I mean, you, you think, all right, who am I? What, have, what has happened to me? How can I set some kind of pattern that is going to be good for me for the long haul? So in my case, uh, after I tucked my kids into bed, I reserved time when I could just let myself go totally let myself go. I put on soulful music that for me was really healing. Um, I read some psalms that were psalms of lament, raw lament. I would lay flat on my face on the floor and just weep day after day, week after week, month after month. It's interesting to observe. I, I wasn't much of a crier before the accident. And my internal soul was rewired and I've never gone back. I cry all the time now. Something happened to me that has been irreversible when it comes to my own kind of internal wiring. And uh, I did those, those and other practices for years. And that kept me alive, actually. Yeah. Um, it, it, it didn't contain it so much, 
Um, I mean, I felt a lot of things that were really harsh, but it, it, it set a kind of pattern, a rhythm for me that I found really, really helpful. I met with a small group once a week of men that were really close to me. Interesting, 30 years later, we still meet after all this time. I love that about your story. There were some other things that were really important to me too. And then eventually I began to read, but man, I went on brain fog for a long time. I did not actually do much reading after the accident. It took me, oh boy, a couple of years to really get back on my feet intellectually and begin to engage with ideas and to think a little bit more reflectively. I also kept a journal, by the way, and I just spilled on that journal, just spilled. When I wrote A Grace Disguised, I started writing it three years after the accident. I reread that journal and I just wept when I read it. I had no idea how, how dark my world was. And uh, after I reread it and I took notes on it, I burned it. Oh, I could wow. not, I could not go back to it again. Wow. It was, it was even too much for me. Wow. So uh, Grace Disguised is a kind of memoir, a theological memoir of, of that journal, but that journal, I, I, I would not want anyone to see. Yeah. Including me. I, I can, I, I had not heard you say that before. Um, but that is, I'm absorbing that I'm running that through my own grief filter and, um, I can, I can, I get that. I, I mean, I can, I can resonate as to why you would do that at first. I'm like, Oh no, what, you know, it's, it's so personal. It's, it's your, it's your life. It's your, it's everything. But on the other hand, I can resonate with why that would be something that you would do. I know there are some songs that, um, that were so beautiful to me right after Matthew died. I, I mean, the songs meant the world to me. They, they, they touched my heart. They enabled, they comforted me, but I don't want to listen to those still. There are some now that I just get, they're still in my playlist, but mm. I skip past them because mm. they were exactly what I needed in that moment. You know, they were what I needed, but to go listen to them now is takes me to some places I, yeah, I right. don't really want to go. That the, those songs are the counterpart to my journal. It's yes. interesting. The songs that I played, I'm kind of a classical music guy. So I played a lot of classical music like Foray's Requiem. And uh, one of my favorites is Durif uh, Durifle's Ubi Caritas. And I still listen to it. I still listen to a lot of the, that music. And Patricia will say to me, when you listen, your ears tear or eyes tear up almost immediately. That is one place I can't, I can't get to you. Yeah. It's so deeply private. So instead of trying to get to me, she just holds my hand or stands yeah. with me and is with shows, you. In shows it. love yeah. to me, is with me yeah. in it, but can't enter in to the same degree. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a difference between the two of us. And, and, and it makes the point, you got to figure out a way to ritualize it. Right. And to do it over the long haul. This is like long haul right. COVID here. This is not a month or two journey. And really it's a it's a lifetime journey. It never really ends. But I love I that you say that. You can learn to carry it differently. Yeah, because I that at first could be very discouraging to think because you you say there is no recovery. You don't recover from um some some losses you don't recover, but neither should we even try to recover? And that at first, I know some of that for me was like, ah, oh, I, I can't, if I think I'm going to feel this way forever, I don't, I don't know how to do that. But that's not what you're saying. You're not saying, no, I'm not. that's I'm not. not what you're saying, but we're just always looking. We want to get better. We want to feel better. better. We want to move on. We want to get we want to move on. We want to push through. I would argue we grow into it. Yes. And we learn to carry it differently. It becomes a little lighter. Um, it, it just, it's like wearing clothes that we grow into, you know, you're eight years old. They're too big. By the time you, they're 12, you're 12, you, you wear them more comfortably. I think that 
is the best. And, and here's why. We don't want to get over it. This is part of our story. We have to learn to carry it forward and to have that experience, whatever it happens to be. It doesn't have to be a death. It can be many other things so that it continues to form our lives. It has a formational role. And if we get over it, we've really lost an opportunity to be transformed by it. Yeah. You know, you wish you could have it both ways. <laughs> the transformation yeah. without the pain. Well, absolutely. In, it's a, fallen, like, it's in like, a fallen world, we, we can't, we don't have that option. No. And it's like, we want, we want our, I'm looking at, I have a scar on my hand from when I was a little kid and I think it's kind of ugly, but you know, I can't get rid of that scar. I mean, really, I can't. And most scars, you know, we, it'd be like saying, no, I don't want, I don't want any record of, of, of that pain, you know, or what happened or where I have grown through it. And it's just not, it's just not really possible. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not even a good goal Mm -hmm. uh, to have, but I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't know that at first. You, you talk about, you mentioned it um, a few minutes ago that you prayed as you were in the ambulance heading to the hospital after the accident. And then you said, and I didn't pray again for two years. And again, first time I read something like that in a grace disguise, I was first blown away. And then secondly, immense, immensely comforted and encouraged to think that I was not some kind of a heretic because I found it hard to connect with God in the same way at first. So talk to us about that. Well, um, it, it, it dealt with a kind of a range of practices that were pretty natural to me, praying, reading the Bible, just believing, I mean, (laughs) believing. And uh, after the accident, Kay, I was so exhausted just making life work and so emotionally wrung out and so profoundly sad, a deep sadness that, that went to the bottom of my soul. And whenever I went to worship, I, there was nothing there. It wasn't like I disbelieved. It wasn't like I cursed God. It wasn't like I refused to pray. I just didn't have the energy to do any of it. But I make my living as a church historian. That's what I teach. And what I write, like, well, Resilient Faith, you've read that book because you endorsed it. Thank you, by the way. It's a great book. And uh, I, I realized, you know, I, my life is situated in a company of saints, a company of followers of Jesus that spans 2,000 years with all their experiences, all their suffering, all the darkness they faced and the triumphs they experienced. And these people are like sentinels for me. They stand with me in my sorrow and in my pain. Um, I let let the church pray for me, even when it wasn't praying for me. You you see the difference? There are two ways. They did the praying. They did the praying. And they kind of created a wake that dragged me along. When, When they sang in church, I couldn't sing. And they sang for me. They believed for me. It wasn't like I doubted. I just didn't have the energy to believe. And I realized that the church just carried me for a while. And it's meaningful to me now because I sing loud because I'm aware of the people around me who probably can't sing. And when I'm, when I'm, when I'm worshiping, I'm thinking about the other people and the grief or the losses and pain they're facing, many of them unspoken, and my own worship is creating a wake that can carry them along for a while. I love that. And I think that happens now. And I also think it happens in a strange kind of way through history. The people of God stand as sentinels for all of us. You know, the, 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 uh, the, the theolo- theology makes a distinction between the church militant and the church triumphant. The church triumphant is the church in the presence of God in heaven. The church militant is the, is the people of God, and they're still working things out here on earth, fighting against sin, dealing with suffering day in and day out. And that church triumphant sees us. Hmm. They're witnesses to us. They're the great cloud of witnesses, as yeah. the book of Hebrews mentions. Yeah. And we, we get a little bit of a taste of that now, Kay. 
you know, you and I, we're veterans of this to some degree. And we do some of that stuff for other people. And people did that for us. It means the world to me. It, it for me as well. And I feel a very similar uh, sense of responsibility to, I hadn't thought of that analogy of, you know, how, how the believing people around you kind of, you got drug along in their wake yeah. and, and how, what a great thing that was. And I, I hadn't thought of it like that, but that is what I am trying to do, um, even in worship. Um, I was raised in very straight laced, um, you know, very conservative churches where um, somebody made a joke. Um, you know, we were they said they said we were a one body part church. You could move one body part only at church. And I said, <laughs> I grew up in a <laughs> I said, I grew up in a zero body part church. Nobody moved nothing. Yeah. Um, during worship. And so that was not comfortable for me, even as, as throughout my life of, you know, that more freedom of expression of raising my hands or, um, you know, um, clapping was challenging just because I couldn't dance either. But, but um, after Matthew died, I don't care what people think. I, I don't care. Maybe I'm clumsy in the way that I worship. Maybe I look silly you know, with my, maybe I don't raise my hands in the right way. I, I don't care anymore in terms of anybody's um, critique of me. I, I know that as, um, as the pastor's wife in our church, I know that people watch me. I know that I've, that's just inevitable. They, they want to know what's she doing? What's she thinking? How's she doing? So at first I couldn't bear that watching. And so I didn't come to church for a while because I couldn't bear to be watched. And then when I did came, come back after four months, I sat in the back of the worship center surrounded by very safe people because they were, they were my armor um, and I could do it, but I still was aware that people were watching. And so I was cautious in even how I expressed myself and often had to leave in tears. But now, I mean, often I'm on the front row and my hands are, if it's, there's a song that I want to praise, especially when it talks about death being overcome and the victory of, of that the grave has been beaten and that, you know, we are not prisoners to the grave. And my, my hands are up. And I'm, it's as much, it is for me because of the freedom of thank God that he has overcome the grave because if he lives again, and I'm getting ahead of us, but if he lives, if, he, if Jesus lives, then Matthew lives and I will live again. And so will all who know Jesus. That's reason for my hands to be up in the air. But at the same time, it's as much for somebody else who might not be able, who is barely there. I mean, it's taken everything that they had to be at church that day. Mm -hmm. It's taken every shred of their emotional and physical energy. And if they can know that I have been to hell and back and, and can praise God, then maybe it's dragging them along that's in right. my way as well. And I, that, I, I, oh, that oh, is oh. a deep joy to me. Yeah. I always encourage people just get back into that or in, into worship, go to church. Even if you're like a, a log that never moves and never does a thing, there's something about being with the community of faith. There is no such thing as a solitary Christian. Yeah. We live in such an individualistic culture and there is no individualistic Christianity. We borrow from each other all the time. And um, sometimes we're the ones that do the borrowing and sometimes we're the ones that do the lending, but mm -hmm. we do this as a people together. Yeah. And I, yeah. I have a very vivid memory of going down. We did intinction when we had communion. I always walked down to the front of the church. My three little kids kind of huddled around me. And when I went up to take communion or the Eucharist, I probably cried every Eucharist for the first five years. Uh, I was so overwhelmed with emotion. My, my wife, Patricia, remembers watching me do that because we went to the same church together. And uh, all those people praying for me. But now I see all the people that are doing the same thing. They limp up there. You can see their faces are sad. They're brushing away tears. We're the people of God. And we do this for each other. 
I love it. I'm glad I'm glad I went to worship, even though I felt like I was doing nothing while I was there. Well, the people of God were doing it for me for a while. Yeah. And there's no shame in that. No shame. No. That's really important to me that anyone who's listening or watching um, and finds himself in that, that they don't feel any shame if right. being there is difficult, but just to take your encouragement to be there, even as you say, even if it says nothing moves, <laughs> nothing moves, you can't even speak, you can't talk, you can't interact, but just to have your body, you know, in that yeah, place if possible. There. Yeah, and it's I, I, it feels awkward. Yeah. Sometimes, especially at first, people don't know what to say. They say nothing. They say stupid things. Right. I just, I just let all that go. Yeah. I thought everyone's trying their best here. I, I didn't keep record of all the stupid things that were said to me because I've said a lot of stupid things in my life too. Well, I that just, would have been a whole. That would have been a whole different book. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah. all the stupid things that people say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, meaning, but really not very. Um, not very helpful but um, i emphasize the well-meaning part of things yes the stupid part of things yeah. you're more generous than i am i <laughs> i I, uh, <laughs> I i just remember thinking come on telling me that you lost your dog um as much as i loved my dog telling me you lost your dog so you know how i feel that my son died by suicide no i'm sorry you do not yeah. And um, I still have a little bit of a hard time with some of that, but, <laughs> but I, but I, I am more gracious now knowing that often people do mean well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you said again, something that affected me nine years ago when I read your book, it affects me every time I read it. It has so many practical applications. It even has pra practical applications for us living, I think in a, in a, a world where COVID still exists, where the world that we knew is is maybe gone forever, or at least parts of it are gone forever. Yeah. But you make you make the statement that something to the effect of life does not have to look um, as it always did for it to be good. Yeah, that has held me and carried me and takes me through so many situations because I don't want things to change, and they do. And if I can't have for a long time, it was if I can't have my son, then life can never be good again. Our family will never be good again. Mm -hmm. If I can't, you know, if, if Matthew, if my daughter moves to Idaho, which she did, and takes three of my grandchildren with her, life will never be as good here. And I live in a world where things may never be exactly the same. If it doesn't look like it did pre 2020, then it won't be good again. And, and you just, you've learned something very different from that. Yeah. Well, I mean, what choice do we have uh, uh, if we live in misery for the rest of our lives? But here's what happens, I think, Kay, is um, we will often idealize a moment in our lives. Uh, and we'll think that's the good. Hmm. We label it the good. Could have been a courtship. It could have been when you had just one child. It could have been when your kids were little or you had a, a certain job or a certain configuration of life, and you fixate on that and say, that's the good. And then something happens, you're transferred. Um, the marriage begins to fall apart. Somebody dies, uh, you get sick with cancer. I mean, there are a thousand variations on the theme. And then you start to think, I lost the good and I will never get it back again. Now, in one sense, that's exactly right. If you define the good in terms of a certain set of circumstances, you have permanently lost it and you will never get it back. But if there's flexibility and you think, well, that good is gone, but that doesn't mean another good might not come and the new good might be informed by the loss of the old one. Um, loss can have a transformative effect on our life. We don't want that to be true because we don't want the loss to be true, but it can form us in a way that actually increases our capacity to see and experience the good. In other words, the good is not just circumstantial, it's what happens inside us. It's the combination of the two that matters. Uh, there's the good of the happy family when all the kids were little, and there's the good that comes when you're constantly adjusting to new change 
and losses and difficulties when your kid goes through a difficult stretch or whatever. And that becomes a force that enlarges the soul, changes our capacity, enlarges our capacity to see the good and embrace the good. Now, you know, I wish it all happened naturally, but it, it doesn't. We're, we're fallen, we're broken people. I wish, as I said earlier, that we could have it both ways, that we could have all the transformation that happens through pain and suffering and loss, but then not have the pain and suffering and loss. Absolutely. But we, we can't. Absolutely. But the that good can be there, and a lot of it has to do with what happens inside us. It's a matter that's, of capacity. That's, that's a great, that is a great point. And that's one of the tips that you offer, you know, in, you've got like eight tips that you're offering people um, in, in one of the, in one of the last chapters. And that's one of them is um, just looking at the capacity, you know, that develops, but that made me think of um, something else that I wanted to cover. And then, and then we'll wrap up here in just a few minutes, but you also shared another piece of wisdom that really impacted me. Um, it's in, in uh, one of the new chapters when you talk about how we can't live two lives at once. Yeah. And that kind of speaks, we talked earlier a little bit about regret, having regrets or having, you know, what if this, but just really zeroing in, I can tell you the times so many times and have talked to other um, people in grief who, who have a, who are, it's very difficult. They're trying to live two lives at once. Yeah. What if this had never happened? Right. And, right. and, um, and, and yet here's this life I have now talk to us about that. Yeah, actually uh, I'll give you uh, uh, an actual experience. Um, I was talking to my son, David, he's the uh, middle child now, and uh, he lives in Spokane. Um, and uh, I, I had never asked him how he felt about my writing a book. A Grace Disguise, because it was so little when I wrote it. And I, I, I was always curious. My older daughter is, is spoken, but I never talked to him about it. I said, how do you feel about that? And he said, well, dad, I actually feel pretty good about it. It doesn't touch my daily life. I mean, I grew up in a professor's home. You went to Whitworth every day. I played soccer. You coached us. We went to church. We did fun vacations. It didn't really touch our lives. Every once in a while, someone would say, oh, are you Jerry Sitzer's son or something like that? But, but he said it happened infrequently enough that it didn't touch my life very much. Well, then that led to a conversation about what you mentioned. And I said, what do you think about life now in the wake of the fact that you lost a mother and a sister and a really active grandmother? What, I mean, what, what do you think is this mid thirties young man? And he said, well, I miss mom every day. I think about her every day. And I think about Diana Jane. And that is a, a, a sadness to me, dad. It's a big sadness to me. But he said, I also like my life the way it is now. I love my wife. I love my children. Uh, and none of that might have happened if the accident had occur hadn't occurred. So I don't know, dad. I mean, you, you miss the old and you're grateful for the new. You can't have them both ways. You, 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 you look at the old and you say, I am sad. You look at the new and you say, I am grateful. That's the tension we have to live in. I mean, it's really weird when you get remarried. I was widowed wow. for 20 years and then I remarried Patricia just 11 years ago. And what do you do? I mean, I still love my first wife. Patricia knows that. That doesn't bother her at all. As she says, it says something about your capacity for love. That works to my advantage, not to my disadvantage. Mm -hmm. But I absolutely adore my new wife. Mm -hmm. I call her my first wife the second time around. Well, there it is right there. What do you do with that? Right. You mourn and you embrace. Yeah. To both end, it's not an either or. Yeah. I, I just, I, I'm thinking of, you know, I actually opened in my, in my book to where, because that you spend a couple of pages on that concept and it really just impacted me so much. Um, 
you, you make a very simple statement. You said we wouldn't be the same people and our story would be so different. We only know the life we have now. It is all we have. From the moment the accident occurred, life began to unfold without our loved ones present. Their absence, not their presence, changed us, or better put, the presence of their absence. Our response to that absence played the leading role. And you said, this is our, and then you went on and you talked about marrying Patricia and, the, and her daughters that were now part of your life. And you said, this is our life now. We will never know. And this is, this is the part that I have to keep reading over and over. We will never know how that other story would have unfolded. Yeah. What would have come of it and what we would have become as a result of it. We only have this story shaped by tragedy and absence to be sure, but also by new gifts and graces. It has been a good story too, only a very different kind of story. Yeah, that's it. And I you know, think that that is a very powerful word to us to not try to live multiple stories at once. We're not like movie characters no. that can have multiple lives going on at once. We're flesh and blood people, and we only live one story at a time. Yeah. And, um, and to know that in some ways, spending probably too much time wondering how it would have been different had my son not killed himself, had you not lost your wife and your daughter and your mother in a terrible accident. But as you say, we would have been different people. Everything. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it would have had a better mm -mm. outcome. Those are just not things we can know. No. All we can do is live this one and try to live it well. Yeah. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen to that. You know, I, I say in that uh, one of the new chapters too, that as I've matured as, as, and as my capacities have grown, I see more and more that one of the, uh, uh, the art of living, at least in part, is learning to live in tensions. I actually relate in that chapter one morning in the fall of 2020, I walk outside, I still get a newspaper that tells you how old I am. <laughs> and uh, it, it was um, early in the morning, it was, it was dark out and I saw Venus in the, in the Southern sky and it was gigantic. It was so beautiful and big and bright, vivid. I mean, it looked like a small moon. And I just gazed at it for a while and I thought, this is so lovely. And then that afternoon, my sister called me and my great nephew who had started at Whitworth just that fall had a leave because he had a diagnosis of cancer. And she called and said, it's osteosarcoma. And there's a very good chance he's going to lose his leg, which he did a month later. And that set off a journey of 16 months of chemo and surgeries and pain and more chemo and this and that until he died three weeks ago. Uh, and that's, that's the other side of the story. It's like, on the one hand, you've got beauty. And on the other hand, you have terror. And those get all entangled together all the time. Daily. Daily. And that's the tension we have to live in. And that metaphor of Venus and a diagnosis of osteosarcoma in a young man is imprinted on my soul. That's it right there. That's life. All kinds of amazing moments that God gives us. And we need to grow in our capacity to see them and enjoy them and embrace them. And on the other hand, we are just overwhelmed by the Russian invasion of Ukraine or all the tragedies related to, to COVID. It's interesting. I'm sure all of us have seen these images uh, in hospitals of people with intubation cube, uh, tubes. And uh, we know that it's gonna be a day or two and they're gonna die. And then we'll see another image of somebody being rolled out on a wheelchair who battled COVID for, I don't know, six weeks and survived. And the whole hospital staff stands in the hallway and applauds them. Think about the tension all those healthcare workers have been living in every day 
looking for moments of grace and triumph when somebody survives and yet facing the specter of death almost every day. If we didn't have Easter, oh, it would all be too much. Yeah, all too much. It would all, all would be too much without my that. Favorite, my favorite day in that, in the season of Lent and Holy Week is Holy Saturday. Uh, it's the day when you look back and you look ahead. It's the day of uncertainty and confusion and darkness. The son of God has been crucified. All of your dreams have been washed away. You thought he would be the one to deliver Israel and solve all of our problems. And he was executed. And yet the next day that you don't know is coming is Easter. And everything changes on a dime. And death and sin and hell and evil and fanaticism and meanness and hatred and violence, all of that is conquered by the one who died to kill death and conquer death in the resurrection. There it is. That's the tension. Holy Saturday. Would you pray for us as we close? Our God, we bring <laughs> our broken selves to you. We stand on the abyss of such a great mystery. You've made us in your image, and yet we're broken and sinful people. You've made us to experience joy and beauty and peace and goodness, and yet there is so much darkness and suffering in the world. Help us to see you in all of it, that you're here with us, that you're present, and that your plan is redemptive. You will make all things right and whole and well again, and you will wipe away every tear. And we see the final and complete and beautiful evidence of that in Christ's triumph over death itself in the resurrection. We thank you for that in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. The Lord bless and keep you, Kay. You're a good soul. Love you, you a lot. Well. You as well.